Just let me know. Okay, so we're live over here in the live stream. So this is kind of like nationwide. And of course, we invited you know everybody who's pretty local, except for a couple people. Um, so so welcome everybody. I don't know how to quite do this yet. I've never done it before. But um, so the reason that we wanted to put this together today is first of all, we're in a brand new facility. Um, we've got a you know a new store that we're opening up so that you know people who could come by today and knew that we were here as a resource would know, hey, whether you need to pick something up or you call us tomorrow and say, man, we're in a jam. We've got a you know a job going on. Is there any chance we can meet halfway or something like that? You know that's kind of how we built the business to begin with is just you know serving our customers to the best of our ability. Um, so I, I wanted to just you know bring everyone in as many people as you know want to be here and you know see what we're doing um, and then start these workshops because we're in a a time where labor's tight. Um, and you need to do more with fewer people. And so we want to go through this information um, and share efficiencies that we've learned over the years with you so that you can get more out of less. And then we're going to be doing, you know, starting these workshops regularly, probably on something like a, a weekly basis here and then at each of our locations in you know, Maryland and North Jersey and Chicago and Memphis and, and New Orleans so that as you have somebody new joining your team, you can send them in and get them trained on one, two, three workshops at a time that are related to one another. And it's not just, you know, all on your back to do so. We can kind of, you know, share some of that, that burden, but also success together. So um, that's, this is kind of a vision for where we wanted to go. What this began with was the idea that you know, I think Apple is a pretty good model if you're going to follow, you know, a, a, a corporate model out there. And the idea was um, the core line of our, of our products would be what we would you know, have in our shop and then ancillary products that complement that we would grow over time. Um, and we would always offer education and be able to help people as they came through the door and not just be all about, you know, product sales and, and development. So that's, you know, where we're going as uh, as a company um so with that said um we've got two different audiences going on but the same thing will uh, apply for everybody um as we were putting this together we thought okay we're doing these workshops and for a company that maybe has never maybe done a service we get to the um the dis disinfection side of things or maybe it's light mold remediation or maybe it's uh, vapor treatment for odor mitigation in you know homes and, and that sort of thing. We wanted to put together some kits so that they would be affordable, but you could take them with you and go do a job or two. And so on the front side of this, okay, um, this is a two-side document. We've got all of our kits listed out here, okay? There's just an amalgamation that makes sense with each service. And I'll point to that at the end of each workshop so you go, oh, okay, I need that, I don't need that, whatever. So we kitted those out. What we chose not to do is we didn't pair any equipment, any sprayers or anything with that because you don't, you know, you might need four different kits but you probably don't need eight sprayers, right? So we, we didn't pair those together. And then the other side is just the core product line here. So if, for example, you came in today and you said, hey, I'm gonna pick up some product while I'm there, and fortunately our truck is arriving today with, with inventory because we got cleaned out in the last couple of weeks as we were moving, um, then you could you know, do it uh, you know, kind of you know, piecemeal as well. And the, the special that we're running today is um, everything's 15% off, okay, um, for today. So if you need something, feel free to pick it up. All right, so the first thing that I thought we would do before we get too far into these demonstrations is to talk about our safety guide. We, we developed this years ago, um, and the, the focus at the time was really oxidizers. That was when peroxide chemistry was starting to get big, chlorinated chemistries were starting to grow, and chlorine dioxide chemistries were starting to grow. And all of those have that one thing in common. They're all oxidizers, and we're going to be working with each one of those products today. Okay, 
But what I've noticed over time is as we've worked with people, um, people have had the wrong uh, uh, masks, people have had the wrong cartridges. And so we kind of want to slow it down first and go, let's make sure everybody's safe to begin with before we talk about any chemistry or any procedure. And then from there, we can start you know, getting into each real workshop, okay? So the way that we parted this out, if you will, was that we've got three different areas to think about. We've got incidental exposure. And I would relate that to, let's say we were doing a remediation or something in here, right? We've got a lot of air volume. We've got open space. If this was all framed out, we would have a lot of air volume and the likelihood of being in direct contact with chemistry is just going to be incidental, right? It's just going to be missed things of that nature that might get on the person doing the work. And in that case, we, we created this incidental exposure to deal with that. And so you'll notice that in regard to dealing with oxidizers, you would want something like goggles and a face shield. You would certainly want something like an N95 mask, but because that chemical dissipates in the air, you don't need to have something like this, okay? But you also want to think about your skin. And the first thing about skin is you're going to be touching things. I, I make the mistake all the time of touching things before I should. Um, so nitrile gloves are an essential piece of that. And if you want those gloves to remain intact throughout the day, you'd be best served to put on some sort of a work glove that will give you the ability to grasp things, turn things, right? Um, so we always like these coated gloves. Maybe part of it's because in our background with Paradigm Labs, we manufactured a product called Finish CM that keeps this from penetrating the cotton, okay? So I come from an industrial manufacturing background where all of the stuff that we do here translate to the commercial side, and these are made in Sri Lanka, and we make the Finish CM that goes to Sri Lanka to keep that from happening. So that's gloves. And then on the coverall side of thing, just something like a Micromax suit or a Tyvek suit is plenty because you just need it to be splash resistant, okay? So that's all that this represents right here is the very base of protection when you're dealing with an incidental exposure situation. Does that make some sense? Okay. Now. Now we get into a direct exposure situation. And, and if you are following me on the live stream, you can go to our, what is it, our Zoho Docs, and then download the sheet if you've never seen it before or if you need to make copies for your staff. So it's directly in Zoho Docs. So now we get to direct exposure, which says it generally results from working in confined spaces with limited air volume and ventilation where exposure to chemicals is certain but sporadic. So think about a basement, right? We've got less air volume, but we're certainly closed in, right? We don't have as much ventilation and things of that nature going in. Think of an a, a tall attic space like you might see, well, in the Northeast or something like that, or um, not so much the Midwest because there's a lot of older homes that have some small attics that resemble crawl spaces up there. But, you know, large attic spaces, we've got plenty of air volume. So think of that as that direct exposure situation where you're probably going to come in contact with chemical. Now, here's where things really begin to change. When we get into more confined spaces, now we need to be thinking about a full face respirator. Not because the, the full face is as important in this situation, but because these... These cartridges right here, which are your multi-gas, multi-vapor cartridges, are essential when you're in a confined space and you're working around oxidizers. So this combo cartridge here is your, um, is your P100, okay, for mold remediation, but it's also your cartridge to use with all oxidizers. So when somebody says to me, are our guys, you know, got driven out of the space when they were using oxyprep. That means they weren't using a multi-gas, multi-vapor cartridge. So we're trying to get everybody to, to realize like this, if you're going to do anything with chlorine dioxide, 
you're going to do anything on the chlorinated side or the peroxide side, this is essential. Okay, this prevents any chemical that does get on the face from getting to your mucous membranes. Okay, so it may not be as comfortable as a half face and goggles, but it certainly prevents anything from getting to the eye ducts and you know nose things of that nature. Where especially someone who's chemically sensitive could have an issue. Okay, any questions on that while we're talking about? Yep. Yep. Six zero nine two six. Nine two six. Okay. It does. So it stretches across all oxidizers. Okay. Whether it's chlorine dioxide, and, and when we say when we distinguish between chlorinated and chlorine dioxide, they're very different molecules, but they're both. Um, they are both oxidizers, okay? Just like peroxide bases are also oxidizers, okay? So, yeah. Yep. This mask here? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a 6898. Really? Yeah, they don't. That's what typically call in it. Yeah. So test the masks. Even though they're brand new, getting them right out in this crazy world we're living in, the manufacturing something the specs not right. Interesting. I've never had an issue with this one for me though. Yeah, my old one. Yeah. But the four brand new ones, so just keep that in mind. Okay. Medium. 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 Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now the third area is an area that we call prolonged exposure. And this the perfect scenario here is a crawl space, right? You've got a super confined space, and we've all been in those situations before where we've got, you know. 20 inches, 26 inches, something that's less than three feet, you're confined, there's a vapor barrier down there, or even if there's not a vapor barrier, the likelihood of the, the ground getting wetted from chemical because of overspray and things of that nature is pretty high. So I've got some recommendations here for you. We had um, uh, Lakeland come in before we moved into this facility, and we wanted to get their take on um, how long something was chemical resistant and what substrate to use. In other words, the material, what was chemically resistant based upon the material. Um, and so they walked us through everything. And here's what it came down to, is that if you're dealing with um, chlorine dioxide vapors and things of that nature, their Micromax suit is just fine for, for vapors. Once we get over to the liquid side of things, and we get into peroxides. Now, if you want something to be eight hours chemical resistant or more, you want. Choose a Chemax 2 suit and it's completely resistant. But here's one additional thing it doesn't cost much more to get a taped seam. Have you ever seen it when you come out of a crawl space and you've got ones right here? Anywhere where there's a seam, it's because the seam isn't taped. Okay? But if you do a taped seam, it's impervious to any chemical spray or anything of that nature. So make sure when you buy them, um, there's a, there's a company called like Wise Safety. They're, they're another brand now, but they're nationwide. They're a great resource for um, Lakeland supplies and all those sorts of things. But I was surprised to find that not even like the DuPont products seem to offer the same level of customization and availability as compared to Lakeland. So look at the Lakeland brand 
and look at the Chemax 2 suit for anything peroxide based. Now, when we jump into liquid applied chlorine dioxide or liquid applied chlorinated products like oxyprep and things like that, Chemax 3 is completely resistant to the chlorinated products. Okay, and then that's where you'd want to also have your tape seams, and it's going to be completely impervious there. So we've covered the right respirators to use. We've covered the right coveralls to use, and I would include in that if you're using liquid applied anything, always get it with a with a hood, right? That way it marries right up to your respirator, and we've formed a seal. Okay, and always get them with the taped seams. Like these seams right here are not taped. So if I pull on this, we'll be able to see daylight right through those seams. You get taped seams and that won't happen. Does that make some sense? Okay. And then we've talked about how important nitrile gloves are and just the practicality of not wearing through them throughout the day by having some sort of a work glove that'll give you a, a decent grip. Okay, like a coated glove or something like that. Any questions on the safety guide, how we've laid it out, what we mean when we talk about incidental, direct, and prolonged exposure? No? Okay. All right. So let's move that aside. And now we can get into what well, I was going to do this in the afternoon. I thought, you know, let's talk about this in the morning because it, it's really to understand and value. So you can take all of this information and buy my competitors' products and, you know, spend more money. Um, so the first thing I want to do is draw a baseline for disinfection. But again, this is across the board. I've added three areas of dwell time because all three of these things begin to um, drive you toward what's the best value. Uh, and do you understand it? Do you understand how it's a Affecting your profitability, okay? And I want to do that before we get into the things. Then we can refer back to this as we go through, okay? So in dwell time, we are with dwell time when I say that, first of all. Okay, so I'm just going to pick up a Dutrion tab real quick. Anytime you are disinfecting, in other words, with an EPA registered product, that has kills claims associated with that, it's always going to tell you how long the dwell time must be to those results, okay? So if you're dealing with a list end product like this, it's going to tell you if you want to kill COVID on the surface, it's going to require a certain dwell time. And if you're dealing with something, let's say, chloride, that's going to vary from about five minutes to 10 minutes. We are dealing with something like this, a chlorine dioxide, it's going to be one minute. And that's where value is understood because it's not in what this product costs to make a gallon of it. It's once you make that gallon, how far does it go, right? If I were to draw out 100 square feet here in front of me, 100 square feet here in front of me, and we were to apply enough product to stay wet for one minute and enough product to stay wet for 10 minutes, which one are we going to apply more product to? 10 minutes, right? Probably four to five times the amount of product here. So if this product is $5 a gallon to make and another gallon, another product, product B is a dollar a gallon to make, they're equivalent values performance wise and cost wise, right? Because here we're putting down enough to give me a dwell time of a minute. Here we might need five minutes, 10 minutes, whatever the case may be. To make some sense of, of the first echelon that you want to really think about is dwell time and, and how that impacts your cost. The second then is your labor, okay? If it takes me five times more time to put down a product, because I need five times as much, right? Let's assume a square feet takes me, I don't know, two minutes to apply, okay? And over here, I can do that 100 square feet in 30 seconds, just for general numbers. Now I can move four times faster over here because of dwell time. So I can do four times as much work with a one minute dwell time as compared to a five minute dwell time, let's say, okay? 
So that's the second echelon that determines value. And those two things together then give you your real cost. Because at the end of the day, you've got your product cost, you've got your labor. Two, cost of goods, labor, right? Two of the most expensive things in your business. <laughs> and if you can begin comparing your products that way, then you can quickly choose who your suppliers are, right? At least on the chemical side of things. And that's going to extend when we do this again next month and do coatings and sealants and things like that. You're going to find the same thing over there. So it's a good baseline for us to draw is, is where is the value based upon those two items. Do you have any questions about that before we get a little deeper into like use and, and that sort of thing? Okay. So the next portion of this is why does disinfection matter in the first place? And maybe we should do a little bit about defining um, disinfection as we go. So disinfection only begins once you have a clean surface. And we have changed um, surface forever. And, and if, if you're around me, I've always kind of given this KFC type of thing. Like if we were to have lunch here right now, we're going to have barbecue in a little bit and we had a dirty table in front of us, we wouldn't start disinfecting that table. We would clean the table first, and then we would come back with a disinfectant and allow it to dwell for whatever the prescribed dwell time is and let it dry, right? That's the proper way to disinfect the surface. But as we go through in the mold portion of this, I'm going to draw out distinctions about what we see in the industry so that you can make up your own on what best practices are but I'm just going to share the soil load removal with you. Every disinfectant will say something like pre-clean surface to use, okay? And then that disinfectant will either be a just a straight-up disinfectant, or it might be a cleaner and disinfectant, or it might be a cleaner deodorizer and disinfectant, okay? With Dutrion, and I can only speak about our products, You'll notice that it's a viricidal disinfectant, so it's N-list approved, but it's a cleaner, it's a disinfectant, and it's an odor in, in one product. Okay, so we get a lot of bang for our buck here. Um, but you know, further than that, why does disinfection matter? We're, we're living in a unique time right now where everybody's very cognizant of each other, right, of surfaces, and surfaces are where, you know, things live, right? It's why you can't disinfect air. Like you can't, you know, just, you know, blow disinfectant in the air and now you've disinfected something because disinfection has to do with surfaces, not about the air. So it's why when someone asks me a question about, can we fog it? And it's kind of like, I take a deep breath and it's like, let's talk about what disinfection is first because disinfection only applies to surfaces which is why a standard EPA label will always refer to surfaces. It's going to be hard surfaces, semi-porous surfaces, porous surfaces, and things of that nature. And that drives at what claims you can make with a product, okay? But we are living in a time where people are more cognizant of this, and therefore there's more opportunity. And so I want to just consult my notes here. So the desire for disinfection is at an all-time high. And there's a certain peace of mind that goes along with disinfection, okay? And I'm going to walk you through, as we walk through this together, I'm going to also talk about how you sell disinfection. And this afternoon, if you stick around for our 2 o'clock, 2 to 3 o'clock, we're going to go into a, a sales process sort of thing as well. Um, disinfection surface, services are simple, and they're very simple to sell. And I want to take you through exactly how they are sold. We'll do it this afternoon, but I want to build a case for it right now. Okay, so why disinfection matters? There's a high, there's a higher desire for disinfection. It provides peace of mind, and they're simple to implement. They're simple to sell. How to disinfect properly. So I, I put a step-by-step -step guide here, and you're going to notice that now we kind of come back to what we've covered before, and that is when we're talking about a disinfectant like Dutrion, they're very safe to work with, right? What do we need? Well, an N95 mask, it's not on the SDS sheet. I can tell you that right now. We simply recommend it for chemical, chemically sensitive individuals, okay? Um, eyes, 
glasses like this are just fine, or goggles, whichever you prefer. And then nitrile gloves. Okay, so that's the only thing. And the nitrile gloves are just because we're handling tablets. Okay, you'll notice that there are two SDSs for these. One is a shipping SDS. That means in concentrate form. That's not the one that you'll use. You'll use the use SDS. Okay, and that use SDS will show you exactly how safe these products are. But when handling them, the only thing that we, what we recommend is have your people use a nitrile glove. I'm not a great um, case for this because I handle them all the time without nitrile gloves. Okay. I'm going to bring over a gallon as well. So as we go through this, we can talk through it together. So let's talk about some material requirements because, again, it's a very simple service. All you need is a sprayer, okay, of some sort. But we like these. Okay, so we've got a sprayer or a sprayer. We've got Dutrion tablets. And if you want it to smell really good, we've got a product now that's called Sorbacist. Has everyone smelled Sorbacist yet? Okay. It's just a really fresh fragrance that was developed actually when um, there was a lot going on with hand sanitizers and they needed to smell good instead of smelling like alcohol. Um, so this product... The, the initial fragrance, which is an essential oil so that people aren't chemically sensitive to it, um, was developed. And um, I'm going to use a little bit of it today with everything you do so you can kind of get an idea of how it changes the experience of the customer from potentially smelling chemicals to it just smelling fresh and clean. Okay, so we'll, we'll just do that throughout the day today. All right, so what I've got here is I've just prepared a gallon of water. Now, there's two ways that we can go about diluting the product. One is I always think of our four gram tabs as our gallon tabs, okay? And what we wanna do is place four of these into a gallon, okay? And you'll notice that one of the benefits to Dutrion is it doesn't take up a whole lot of space. In fact, I'll show you, this is a 24 pack of Dutrion right here, okay? I can make, um, let me think about this, I can make 12 five gallon pails with this, okay? So it doesn't take up a lot of space in your shelf or in your, your truck or whatever it might be. So we're just gonna put four tablets in here and these are effervescent in nature. Now, I've got just water in here as well. Let me make sure this is my Dutrion. Yep. And in this one, I'm just going to go ahead, because I've got just over a gallon, I'm just going to go ahead and put my 20-gram tablet. So I have 16 grams in here. I'm just going to put my 20-gram tablet in there. So now what I've created are 400 part per million solutions. One, two, three, four. Okay, can I hand this to you? So I've got 400 parts per million, and we're gonna talk about parts per million as we go here. Um, and let me stop right here and, and just kind of give you the broad strokes of parts per million. When you're dealing with chlorine dioxide, it's always expressed in parts per million. Parts per million refers to a, a liter slash quart. They're close enough that you can kind of get away with either size. If we were in Canada, we'd be dealing with liters. Here we're dealing with quarts. So if I were to make one quart, I would use a four gram tablet that is 400 parts per million. When I move here, I'm using four tablets, four gram size. I still have 400 parts per million per quart okay so whenever i'm thinking parts per million i'm thinking about the the quart or the liter is in the back of my head right because when we get into some things on odor this afternoon you're going to see oh now we're talking about 1200 parts per million and you want to be thinking about 1200 parts per million per quart okay that's how we're going to formulate i've done all the calculations in the sheets here so that you can see exactly where i'm coming from and you're not going to have to do any math all right so then when we go here, right, I've got a, a gallon and a quarter of, of water here. I put a 20 gram tab in, I'm still 400 parts per million. That is where we have 
our viricidal disinfectant that is a disinfectant for bacteria. So think water jobs, viruses, think COVID cleaning, right? Um, uh, fungus and spores, algae, things of that nature are mixed in there. And here's a great reason to always wear work gloves <laughs> and, and not waste uh, not waste a million of these nitrile gloves. So this product becomes then broad spectrum because we've got the hospital side of things covered with viricidal and bacterial claims, the remediation side covered with algae, fungus, spores, things of that nature. Make some sense? Okay, so broad spectrum. Now, let me turn over here and make sure I'm on track. All right, let's talk about board footage before we get going with this as well. Because that's a big thing. How, how many times have you thought to yourself, how far is this product going to go? How many square feet is this going to cover? Right? Well, if, I if I'm dealing with a flat surface like this, I keep getting out of frame. If I'm dealing with a flat surface like this, that's easy to figure that out. Right? If that is two feet by five feet, I've got 10 square feet there that I'm dealing with. But what happens when I introduce joists, right? What if those joists are one foot on center and we're talking about two by eights or two by tens? How does that begin to change the square footage you're dealing with? And the answer is that it can double and up to triple it, right? So when you're thinking about a job, when you're thinking about a mold remediation job or something of that nature, um, or disinfection, you've got to think in terms of how many total square feet are we dealing with here? And one way of expressing that is board footage, right? That's the, that accumulation of total square footage within a structure. Does it make some sense? Okay. The other thing you want to think about is the tip size. So we learned this the hard way. I will tell you, when, when the BTM spray and everything first came out on the market, we didn't know a thing about controlling our tips, our pressures, things of that nature. We were just excited about the product, right? And then we realized, oh, it's really important that we control our fan pattern, the fan width of it, because that determines like how much you're putting on the surface and pressure determines that as well. And then the output is how big that orifice size is. And all those things combined give you more or less control or allow you to work faster as well, right? A, a larger orifice size, a smaller fan width means that you're just putting more product to the surface faster. You broaden that fan out you're putting less product to the surface, you reduce that tip size, you're putting less product to the surface, okay? So there's a lot of control right in the tip itself. For this here, I've put in a, um, a 8001. What that means is we're gonna get a nice wide 80 degree fan width, and we're going to get um, 0.1 gallons per minute, okay, 8001. So we've got 8001s, 8002s, 8003s. We've got 4001s, 4002s, 4003s, right? There's all sorts of sizing that you can go with. And then that's when um, you can begin to dial into, what do I need for this job? Do I need something that, because I'm, I'm 12 inches on center, maybe I need something that's just going to give me about 12 inch wide fan width. 15, 15, 16 inches wide, so I can cover the entire joist bay and the bottom of those joists. And I need to control it, so maybe I'm going to dial it down to a 0.1 gallon per minute. Okay? Maybe you go, well, that's still too much. I need to broaden it and be able to do two joist bays at a time with like an 8001, but it gives me the control I'm looking for and allows us to work a little faster. Okay? So that's just some, some thoughts on how to think about your, your tip sizes. Um, warmer environments. When we get into attic spaces, especially in the summertime and things like that, it's going to dissipate, right? You're, it's going to dry very quickly. So you're probably going to want to take your tip size up. So when we get over to the BTM side of things, that's when we begin to introduce things like this, which are called couplers, where you can have several different uh, nozzles, spray tips, all in a line here. And then you can start to change those out depending upon the condition that you're in, how quickly it might be um, drying, you know, the surface might be drying, and then you can fix it by just being able to move from one tip to the other, and you don't lose your tips. It also acts as kind of like a carrier for your, your tips as well. 
and it saves you a lot of time because these are all quick connections that you can just pop it one in, pop one out, and go you know from one tip or nozzle to the next. Those are interchangeable terms, tips and nozzles, by the way. Okay, so when it comes to Dutrion, you're going to typically get 200 to 500 square feet per gallon out of Dutrion, and that depends on temperature, porosity of the surface, right? There's a lot of variables that go into that. But just for general thought, right, you're going to get 200 to 500 feet per gallon. Now, when I apply it to this wood surface up here, I'm going to use it as a cleaner to begin with. Why? Because we're going to pre-clean before we disinfect, okay? So let me do that. It only takes about, you know, a minute to two minutes for these, you know, before I, do, I use that. I'll just use this because I'm already got it ready to go. Um, I'm going to disinfect the surface starting with cleaning. So right here, we've got some light mold formation on this desktop that I never got around to turning into a desk, okay? So all that I'm going to do is mist this to the surface. Okay, and you see it just immediately wets out whatever is on the surface. Okay. And I think that this is one critical element because, again, we've been talking soil load, soil load, soil load forever. And someone could look at that after even just misting that on the surface and go, well, it's a fungicide, it's a sporicide. It's good enough, right? Because we see that all the time when it comes to like mold stain removal and that sort of thing. But here's what I would share with you. What it looks like isn't, doesn't mean there's no soil load left behind on the surface. Let me just show this to the camera. I don't know if this, it's lagging behind over there. Okay. So that's, that's soil load. Right? So when we get to other parts of this and we talk about stain removal and things of that nature, most of the time there's still always soil load in the surface. And the question is, what's your tolerance for soil load, right? Because soil load is a conducive condition to a future problem, right? It, 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 it's organic. And so if, it, it, you know, if mold spores, which you know, there's mold spores all around us, land back on this surface again, and just because it looks good doesn't mean it's not going to regrow, right? So I always try to do my best to talk about soil load, even though there's a reality of real estate transactions and all these sorts of things. I, I, can't, I, I don't want to stop beating this drum that there's still soil load and a future problem potentially if it's not removed from the surface. Now, once I've got a clean surface, that's when I can go back to that surface and simply miss the product over the surface, and now what do I need, dwell time-wise? A minute, right? So that, that was plenty of product then once we're disinfecting to go ahead and give that a minute dwell time, probably more than enough product on there. But I guess my point behind saying this is, you'll use more product cleaning soil load from a surface than you will actually disinfecting the surface, right? Because it just needs to remain wet for one minute at that point in time. Right? If we were to put a stopwatch on this, it's probably going to remain wet there for five minutes, ten minutes, whatever it might be. Okay, So you know, dial that in with your tip sizes and, and that sort of thing. Okay. I do want to do this. This is just a Dutrion. I'm just going to put about a roughly a quarter of an ounce. Do this. When we, when we developed Storb Assist, originally the first benefit was going to be it will allow the product to assist absorbance <laughs> into the, the substrate faster, right? It will make the product better. And then we realized, man, this fragrance is really popular and people started buying it for the fragrance itself. And we ran into a customer out in Colorado whose real estate agent said, hey, whenever I have a new home that goes on the market, could you come in and just fog that throughout the entire environment so that my new listings smell great when people come into the house? So he turned like this discovery of a good fragrance into um, another service that they're selling now. Um, 
so we'll, we'll use this as we go so you can kind of get uh, a feel for what that does smell like. What do you mean by that? The sorbosis itself? Yep, once we combine, so chlorine dioxide has a limited shelf life. That's one thing you need to know about it. Once you've diluted it, you've got about a 30-day shelf life, okay? So just, you know, be knowledgeable about that. You don't need to go making, you know, drums of ready-to-use product and uh, then be disappointed 30 days later when you have to, you know, throw away 15 gallons or something like that. Oh, compatibility is what you're talking about. Yes, yes. So whether we're using it on a finished surface like a cabinet or on painted sheet metal, um, fixtures, things of that nature, yeah, it's not going to harm those surfaces. It's also not going to leave a residue behind. Okay. Hmm? Stainless steel be fine. Mirrors, okay, it, it literally doesn't leave a residue. And one of the things I would, I would say that's important about that, and I appreciate you bringing that up, is that there are products that are manufactured specifically to leave a residue behind. They're called film formers. Like a quaternary ammonium chloride is what's called a film former, okay? But the problem with a film former is that, let's say you want to clean and disinfect the surface. Let's say it's a crawl space or a, an attic or something like that. And then you want to come behind that with a moisture control, like a clear guard or a max guard or something. Well, the problem is if you use a quat to begin with, that has a positive charge to it, the, that, that, um, the antimicrobial itself, the quaternary mean. Now, the coating, the, the um, uh, antimicrobial in that has a negative charge. They cancel one another out. And then you go a year later and you go, we've got regrowth, the, co the coating failed. No, there wasn't compatibility between the two products. So the reason that we chose to go with chlorine dioxide is that there's no film left over and there's no what are called ionics, right? You got your positives, your negatives, and then your neutrals, and there's no ionics that could interfere with protective coatings and things of that nature. So it just eliminated that risk of failure in the future. Sure, electrostatics are just going to add an ionic charge temporarily to the product. It has nothing to do with changing the chemistry. Yeah. Okay. So we've gone through the protocol. We've talked about um, you know one minute dwell times and things like that. The only other product that I wanted to bring up here is a product called Touchpoint. This is our continuous clean product. Maybe you've you know, heard about this before, but that's a product that then will last about 90 days on a surface after it's been disinfected. So it will continuously clean that. And what the chemistry behind that is, is it's what's called a quat functional siloxane. Quat functional siloxanes are basically a silicone molecule actually bound to a quaternary ammonium chloride as one molecule and they orient uh, orient themselves perpendicular to the surface so they continue to repel microorganisms and things of that nature over time. It's a really great product. It also repels moisture and things of that nature. There's a lot of benefit to it, but then you can kind of put a nice service together of cleaning, disinfection, prevention all in one surface uh, to your customer.
Does it matter when you add the sorb assist to the rate until it's fully emulsed or um, It wouldn't matter which order. Yeah, it's going to work the same. Yep. Okay, let's talk about light mold remediation. And this can be very brief because besides um, what we've all already spoken about, the only additional thing that we would add to mold as compared to just disinfecting a general surface would be the need to remove anything that's loose from that surface to begin with. So we go back to our situation here that's now beginning to dry and we go, okay, well, if we were dealing with this as a mold job, we would have hepavac that from the surface first so that nothing could get airborne, right? So that would be the only change that we would make there for a light mold situation. Dutrion would be the product of choice for that. And we would clean that surface. We would reapply that to disinfect that surface and it would be done. I know Dan, who was sitting behind um, you was, uh, we were down in, what? Yeah, and we were in Chimney Rock and there was that restaurant that had kind of light mold everywhere. And we did that one door that just to show that there was no residues and things of that. So the only thing that you would add to, you know, this protocol, from your standard disinfection protocol is going to be HEPAVAC. And I know that you're get, you're new in the industry. Do you understand why that HEPAVAC is used? Yeah, I actually watched uh, a video on you talking about it. Okay, <laughs> gotcha. I'm going to throw that. Gotcha. Go back behind me with the HP reader. It will basically show that it's correct. That's right. That's right, yeah. Yeah. Because not only is Dutrion a fungicide, but it's also a sporicide, right? So th th it has, chlorine dioxide has an incredible ability to break down like biofilms, spores, things of that nature that most other chemistries don't have. A lot of times you have to get to like heat and things of that nature to, to break down the spores, but that's not true with chlorine dioxide. It breaks down the spore itself. Yes, yes, it, it does a fantastic job at removing, at penetrating and removing biofilm. Yep. And so I, I wanted to touch on these two back to back because they're such similar protocols and the difference being let's prevent cross contamination issues of spores with the addition of the HEPAVAC. Okay. Any questions on this, even though we kind of merged those two together? Mm -hmm. You know, two weeks later, if you still got like in a mold situation, right? If, if, the, if the client chooses not to take control of the humidity, mm -hmm. mold could possibly come back. Sure, good. So what's the what's the window for retesting? Well, it leaves no residue on the surface, right? So I would want to retest as soon as possible. Yeah, you'd want it to be a dry surface, but besides that, you would want to, you'd want to test as soon as possible. You know, could you could you test within twenty four hours? Sure, you could. Depends on the environment, right? That's where things like moisture controls and, and stuff like that are, are pretty handy um, to you know prevent reaccumulation of moisture and, and things of that nature, so that you don't have a, a mold situation. Okay, let's go into a light mold scenario and let me move this out of the way. Let's see how this is going to work. Okay, that worked pretty well. All right, so we've set up a number of different boards here and I've done some initial testing before everyone got here today. So I can kind of walk you through this stuff. 
Here we've got just a, a pallet. Here we've got another pallet. And then the lumber company down the road was kind enough to give me some LVLs to work with. Okay, I've got wood here that quite honestly, it's pretty far gone. <laughs> but I'll walk you through it one step at a time. Okay, so what I wanted to do, because it's always interesting working with pallets, and you, you have to kind of prep everybody for this because when us chemical manufacturers produce those types of videos that are like, here's an attic video showing you how well this stain removal works, and you go, man, in 30 seconds or in 10 seconds, it was completely gone and it looked brand new. Yes, that can happen, especially when you've got nice soft pine wood and it's 80 degrees outside and all those perfect scenarios. And you go to a trade show and somebody shows you that exact same thing in a trade show and over and over again, you go, that must be the best product ever. Well, chlorinated products are fantastic at removing stains, right? But when you go into real world and you go, oh, this palette had drums running all over it. So that looks fantastic there. What's the deal with that? There wasn't any mold there, right? That is some other, um, something else that was introduced to the palette that ended up staining that palette. So as we go through these, or as you're working on your own jobs, the importance about uh, of an assessment and really understanding what you're dealing with. Are you dealing with LVLs and things of that nature where you've got resinous um, uh, resins in that surface, glue in those surfaces that it's extremely difficult to penetrate. If so, it's going to be harder to get staining out of that, right? Do you have hardwoods up in the Northeast and Midwest? They have, um, you know, their structures, their old structures are built out of like oak that over time has, you know, almost petrified has become so hard. And so stain removal for something like that's totally different. So th all the videos that you want to watch online of stain removal are true, but they're true and they're engineered for a specific reason. And I guarantee every single time you look at that, it's going to be primarily plywood. It's going to be pine, those sorts of things, softer surfaces that are easier to remove stains from. Now, with that said, we've got a pallet here and a pallet here. And so I thought we would talk about stain removal, but also preventing that stain removal from being a corrosion issue for you. Because when you have things like this, right? This is um, aluminum, wait, yeah, aluminum. Well, aluminum is a white metal. So when you get corrosive agents on that aluminum, it can become, corroded and brittle over time, and we don't want that to happen. And metals like this, whether it is aluminum or whether it's zinc, right? So galvanized, right? So you can see some initial pitting and things of that nature beginning to occur. Oh, galvanized. <laughs> then we could have a long-term liability on our hands or a short-term complaint if you know the flex duct goes from looking nice and shiny like this in a brand new home to looking something like that okay so the solution isn't just to apply a stain remover to the surface okay and we'll let that just work for a minute or so for us. We want to neutralize that afterward, okay? Especially around areas where we get it on these, these white metals, okay? So white metals are anything that's zinc and aluminum, okay? And they're all over the place. Or if you're dealing with just something like a, a ferrous metal, right? Exposed iron could be another issue for you. Copper would be another problem. Okay, so just think about if you're running a service that is similar to this where you are just wanting stain removal because it's a real estate transaction or something like that, give consideration to the other side of it and that is the need to neutralize. The other thing is that even though wood is pretty substantial, 
it's made out of the same thing that paper is made out of, right? Which is cellulose. Well, when I was in the textile industry and we were dealing with cottons and things of that nature, you would have a bleach range and you, at some point you need to kill the bleach. They would call it kill the chlor, right? And you would do that with peroxides so that you wouldn't continue to have that reaction taking place and break down the cellulosic structure of that substrate. So even though we're probably far from breaking down this pallet, <laughs> right? Um, the truth of the matter is, is that it will dry that substrate out if we just remain on the chlorinated side and we never neutralize. What neutralization does for us is it kills the chemistry some pressure here. And now we go, wait, what happened? Right? Because if you've been around the react extract process at all before, you go, well, isn't that supposed to form like this really robust foam and things? And I, be seeing more than just like these little areas where there's just a tiny bit of foam. Well, what we found over time is this area right here had a good bit of soil load in it. And that when you're dealing with an oxidizer, that, um, that oxidation only goes so far. It only gives you one reaction before you have nothing left. And so what happens is when you have something like that, it's because the, the it, it it literally spent the product in mitigating not only staining, but there's bacteria, there's mold, there's other things in there. And so we didn't get the same reaction that we might expect until we do that. Right? And now, because we had enough chemistry after the initial application of oxyprep on the surface that did a lot of initial work for us, especially on soil load, now we get that reaction that we would commonly see if we were to, let's say, come over and do something like this, which has a little less soil load on it. What are you spraying now? Nope, this is prep. Yep. Okay. So now we go, oh, okay. So now we're at you know, 10 seconds after spraying it. It's you know, lightening that surface up like you would expect OxyPrep to do. So let's do this. We're going to come back behind it with OxyPar. And look at that. Little different between a surface that has a good bit of soil load in it and a surface that really primarily had some light mold, a little bit of mold staining, right? Yes, sir. I want to make sure. So let's say I'm in a basement, and let's say there's mold, and let's say I have a drop filling, and I take out the drop filling, and I see my beans. I also see hair dust running across here. Basically, what you're saying is that you know, you should go ahead and if you want to spray to activate it all the way through, then you come out with hair dust, and we're going to want to neutralize that where we spray. You would either want to neutralize or you would want to cover, right? It would be up to you. You could use some poly sheeting and cover it and never have the issue. But we just want to warn everybody about it because we've seen it happen. I'm sure you've seen it happen. And you go, I don't want, you know, to not get paid. I don't want to have these issues come up. So I wanted to make sure we mentioned, you know, you do you accidentally get some chemistry on something you didn't want neutralize it right away. Could you repeat that for the last thing you guys didn't hear the question? Could you repeat the question? Oh, um, maybe you could give me the question again. I can reiterate. Well, I just, my question was, you know, if you're in a basement that basically has uh, wood beams on the ceiling um, and also has air ducting and we want to spray to activate the, the stain removal. Yep, I got it. Yep. Yep. Right. Okay. So the question is, in any remediation situation, let's say we've got mechanicals, we've got um, ductwork, things of that nature. Um, the question is, would we want to neutralize those surfaces 
immediately following stain removal? And the answer would be yes. That's one possibility. The other possibility is that you would cover those surfaces initially so that you never had the problem to begin with. In other words, cover mechanicals, you know, cover your um, your, your ductwork, trunk lines, things of that nature. But that's not always practical or possible. So in that case, neutralization would be the only way that you would mitigate the chemistry side of things. Yeah. Okay. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, do this for us again because I, I want to just keep going back to this idea of soil load, right? So we've got a surface here that, besides a little bit of foam being on that surface, looks okay right the the problem is that we've got and let me just hit this one more time over here okay um so we're going to allow a little bit of stain removal there problem is we've neutralized the, neutralized this surface and then we go back over the surface which looks great but again, we've got soil load, right? And, and I'll show this to the, the camera as well. We've got soil load. So it, it seems to me that there's this, there's this difference between stain removal and remediation. Mold stain removal is a mold service, which is completely a complete departure from remediation itself where we're practicing cross-contamination control with negative air, HEPAVAC, all these sorts of things. But what we're pushing up against is cost, especially in real estate transactions. So I just want to continue to say that just because we've eliminated a stain on the surface doesn't mean that we have remediated the mold or that the mold or the soil load is gone. It's still there in the surface. And when we neutralize, we see that come to the surface because that neutralization reaction forces the soil load to the surface, right? So what I would say is, if there's an opportunity to be a better educator of the customer and say, do you want this alone or do you want this removed, right? We can remove the standing, no problem at all. Understand there's still a soil load left behind there. Would you like that removed too? And that's where, where we do get into the, the sales process, like we're going to talk about, and we go through those questions to understand what the customer wants and what the customer is willing to pay for so that we give them the exact service that they're looking for. Okay. All right. Then we come from a, we've been in a light situation. We've gone to maybe like a medium mold situation, right, where we've got some soil load and some buildup and things like that. But then we get into heavy mold situations. And I've already done a, an example for you here because I, I want to discern some differences for you before I do anything, okay? This entire board looked like this before I got a hold of it this morning, okay? This, by the way, was waterlogged. It was just sitting in stacks down the road at the lumber yard. Waterlogged LVL, okay? A lot of heavy soil load penetrated this for probably years. And then I wanted to see how we could restore it. Restoring pine, restoring something like this, is very different from this. And quite honestly, if you were to press on this, you're gonna see this is spongy, right? So I would never expect to be able to restore rotted wood fully. So understand that the reason I'm doing this is I, I want to show you, you know, what we run up against in the field. I'm not saying, hey, we're going to be able to make this like new. It's just the reality of what we seem to run into regularly. And I want to build an expectation for performance based upon the amount of soil load that's in that substrate and what we're really dealing with in, in all of these situations. So I, I think I'm going to do this section up here because it seems to be a little more intact than that board over there. Now, honestly, if, if I had heavy soil load to begin with, I would vacuum that soil load from the surface before I ever applied an ounce of chemistry to it. Otherwise, we're just going to be wasting chemistry, right, for, for no reason. So the first thing that I would do is simply vacuum with a HEPA back.
the surf the surface first okay now we like using these types of heads okay it could be any size but these are going to go over nails easily right you're not getting into any scrubbing or into any potential um uh, injury or anything like that right it's going to you know go over nails splinters those sorts of things and just make any soil load removal um easier to do and and faster quite frankly um and that will apply to the extraction side as well so once i've removed anything that is you know could become airborne now i can go to the surface with oxy prep let me i'm gonna try to get an angle on this tucker No, I'm going to try to get an angle for you. Okay, now I'm working right now with, this is an 8002, so I just want to make sure I get it wet out completely. Okay, so this is an 8002 tip, so I'm getting an 80 degree angle and a 0.2 gallon per minute application. Okay, the reason we tend to use a O2 on OxyPrep is that OxyPrep is doing a lot of work. It's having to penetrate any soil load and substrate, so it's going to get absorbed more so than if we just react OxyPar with it. Okay, and maybe I don't know if you can smell it where you're at. I've got Sorbacist in there, so you can kind of smell that that fresh smell. It completely negates. It's one of the, the few fragrances that really completely negates um, any of the odor associated with OxyPrep. OxyPrep can drive you out of a space if you weren't, you know, didn't have proper PPE on, but that, that residual um, fragrance is going to be there to really make a home smell good. Okay, so again, I have no idea what soil loads I'm really dealing with here. This came straight out of a lumber. <clears throat> So now I'm going to go to the surface, and we've been, what, two minutes maybe into this, if that. Okay, now that's a 8001 tip. And the reason that we, again, use the 8001 is it gives us more control. Now, if we were working with the BTM sprayer, we'd be using those same size tips but the difference is that it's electric, number one. Number two, we've got better reach, so everything can remain outside the space. Um, and we can work with lances. Okay? So you'll notice here, I've got a stainless steel lance on this. And what that allows me to do is not work underneath chemistry. Okay? So I've got quick connects on everything. So that's a t um, just a uh, nozzle inside a, what are these called? It's a female, oh, I always get them wrong. Anyway, that's a quick connect. <laughs> socket, plug, plug, female plug with a nozzle in it. And then we've got our socket over here, which is a female socket attached to this. So now, now a 45 degree angle. Now we've got a way for somebody to work under a crawl space but not work under chemistry okay so that's when we go for crawl space work or low slung attics and things of that nature a reason to go from something like this where you have good control and a pump up and, and a decent sprayer to something like this is it'll cut down time because you're not having to pump anything up it exists entirely outside the space and you don't have to work under chemistry does that make some sense okay All right, so now here, we've allowed this reaction to go on for some time. And again, I have no idea what the soil load is on this. So now what's going to be interesting about this is we started with OxyPrep to see what kind of stain we would remove. We reacted OxyPar with it, but check this out. 
I can go back in the opposite direction now and get a re-reaction between oxypar and oxyprep again because there's a little peroxide content still there and then that will begin to tell me something and, and this might not be as interesting to you but what I'm looking for is how much soil load are we really dealing with here versus any staining and things like that and so when I begin to see that come to the surface I know that it's just deeply embedded now here's what I would say is again in your assessment this is when this kind of information can be built you don't have to get to the job to find out you've got a you know based upon what the chem the customer wants you to do you've got a bigger job on your hands than you um than you quoted them right so we've got a customer out in nashville tennessee and what they do is they take a portion of a pallet actually to every customer who they see and they show them what the react extract process is like before they do any sort of an inspection and then they test the substrate in the crawl space first and they share that information with the customer so that they build that estimate the right way right it's going to you know this is going high soil you know situation this is what it's going to take for us to do that which may be very different from a situation like that or you know like this or whatever so i guess what i'm saying is a little bit of work on the front side knowing these things on the front side and building good customer expectations can go a long way in not underestimating and i mean that in terms of like actually providing an estimate to your customer what the job is going to require okay that is if their goal is to have a clean surface a remediated surface and not just a surface that has no or fewer stains okay because i'm seeing a lot of soil load in that surface but looking at it i may not have thought so to begin with you know, i don't know what the white stuff is on there it could be anything but i i do know there's a lot of soil load in that surface any questions about that well how many times would you redo it So here, it's going to bring soil load to the surface again, undoubtedly. So in this case, I would say twice, right? We'll see what it, what it actually looks like in the end, but you know, it may require two applications to really get all that soil load to come to the surface. But I'm not scrubbing, right? I'm not under there. I'm using chemistry to do the work, and I'm not using you know, this physical agitation, somebody's just in there with scrub brushes for days and days, um, you know, spending labor. Okay. So at that point, you just clean, you haven't remediated. Is that the remediation you killed all the mold and everything? That's what you're telling you? So this is what you would say is like the HEPA sandwich, right? If we go back to S520 and we would have HEPAVAC that surface first, and then clean that surface. Normally in, in the traditional way of doing so, you'd be scrubbing that surface till it was clean, and then you would uh, dry that surface, and then you would HEPAVAC again. Does everybody agree that that's the HEPA sandwich, right? In this situation here, we HEPA vacuum, we use React Extract to drive that soil load to the surface, and then we wet extract that surface to remove that soil load, and then the final you know, step in any of this is apply a spore side, right? And for, our, for us, that's going to be Dutrion. Okay. So let me just do the, this uh, extraction once more for us. Any questions about that? 
And again, I'm you know using this only because I have it in my hand right now. But if you know as a spore side, then we would simply have that misted over the surface. The one minute contact time is going to mitigate fungus and spore within the surface. Any questions or anything? Okay. Well, we are over our first uh, time. What we'll do is we'll go ahead and, and take a break for lunch right now on the mold services side of things and come back for odor. Tucker, can we change the um, live stream by 20 minutes this afternoon since I'm over budget? Okay. So we'll just come back at 1.20? All right. Thank you. <laughs> well, I've got stuff to do. I've got to I've got to get everything moved out and moved back in. <laughs>